Welcome to our very first edition of ThinkSpace. ThinkSpace is a collaborative learning experience. People come together here to have in-depth discussions with thought leaders in higher education and to talk about our future. This isn't about sitting in a breakout session that's 90 minutes with someone just talking to you. It's about coming together and actually interacting, throwing our ideas out and being able to come together around something actionable. It's about being at the table to discuss future trends and discuss the implications, not only on the future, but how we can begin to get real-time input into what comes next. And we're doing this with peers, industry leaders, people from all over the world. Today, we discuss modernizing campuses and why it's so difficult. This Think Space is in collaboration with HUG. Let's go to our moderators for today, Matt Alex, Christine Lucer, and Gabriel Christovich. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Matt Alex, and you're gonna get to listen to me, but we're gonna be engaging with you. Uh, we're really excited about the next 90 minutes. It's gonna go pretty fast. Everyone thinks it's gonna be long, but the, the content that we're gonna cover around modernizing a, a campus is um, has a lot of different tentacles to it. And we're really excited about uh, the folks in the room. Uh, we do have um, a, an ambassador, which we call a thought leader, uh, Christine Loser. Uh, from Minerva University, and I'm going to induce her in one second. But I also want to uh, introduce my co-moderator, Gabrielle Christofish, uh, who is coming from Denver. You will hear her dialogue um, through this process. Um, you know, ThinkSpace is about us all collaborating. So we want you to, one, get on XLEAP and join us. That's That's one way to interact with us. We have 75 people, which is amazing amount of dialogue we're going to have. So get in there, tell us where you're from, uh, you know, what school you represent, what title you are. You will start to see the interaction begin there. The other way we can do this is we don't mind being interrupted. Let's have a conversation to it. Um, I'm going to let Christine talk about some of the rules that we uh, hold when we facilitate these things. Um, and just in all transparency, we do this uh, often in a clubhouse setting with with Christine, Gabriel, and I, so we're 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 pretty uh, savvy in, in the way we facilitate these dialogues with you. But we always recognize it isn't the moderators or the thought leaders that really drive the discussion. It's going to be you. Uh, so we welcome you one to just you know if you turn on your camera, if you're camera ready, you know um, go ahead and and raise your hand or even just speak um, speak to us. Um, if you're not camera ready, you can still unmute and have a conversation with us um, or participate on XLEAP. And that would be, you will see the amount of interaction we're going to have. Um, when we think about modernizing campus, we have five reasons, and we're going to start to talk about those five reasons. In, th in the think space, we can go deep. We're going we're gonna to dedicate about 15 minutes to each of those reasons. Um, and that's an important piece because we can dive deeper if, if the conversation allows us to it. If we get hung up on certain things, uh, our moderators will move us quickly through it. Um, the, the deeper we get in, you'll see actually becoming a, a, a critical part of it. Um, so I'm, one, I'm going to let uh, Gabriel uh, introduce herself, and then I'm going to ask Christine to introduce their, uh, themselves. And then I'm going to turn it over to... Um, to Brittany to, to say something. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining today. We are so excited to have you and to hear from you. Um, my name is Gabrielle Christovich and I am the operations and client success, success manager at Beyond Academics. So I've had the amazing privilege um, to work with Matthew um, in a lot of fun endeavors such as this one. Um, and my background actually is in K through 12 education and also supporting university level students um, so I'm really excited to be here and to um, work with all of you uh, to drive higher education forward into the future. So thank you so much. Christine. Okay, and then I'll jump in. My name is Christine Lucer. I'm a professor at a school called Minerva University. I also work on professional learning partnerships. And the thing that Minerva has tried to do is really 
go back to basics to do something quite innovative. So we'll get into kind of the model that Minerva uses if people are curious about it. But the most important thing to know is that we embrace all of the science of learning principles to design a curriculum that really teaches people to be good decision makers and active participants. And to do that, I think that's probably why Matt has pulled me into this is that facilitation is really important. We believe in the power of dialogue and we cannot do that unless you are patient. So I am super excited to be here and I am looking forward to doing far less talking and way more question asking. Thank you, Christine. Brittany. Hi, everyone. I'm Brittany Moon. I'm the HUG Executive Director. Um, so on behalf of myself and the HUG Board, we are just thrilled to be partnered with Matt and Beyond Academics to offer you all this, this Think Space experience. Um, between now and Alliance, you guys are going to have five opportunities to attend online Think Space events. And then I'm going to turn it over to Matt to kind of dive into what we're going to be doing on site at Alliance. Yeah. So, you know, when we uh, started to have the dialogue with, with HUG, I've been at HUG since it started. So I've seen it morph to a lot of different things as we as it grew. Uh, the fact that we are now at HUG and it, it is now open, it's software agnostic, there is a different set of discussions that we're going to need to have. And so I was really excited about you know, having a dialogue about a variety of different topics and the concept of ThinkSpace, which we use um, with our, our clients now, is a concept that we believe that the HUG members can really um, take, take advantage of. So at Alliance, we're going to actually have um, a set of what we call Think Spaces uh, for the two days, the Monday and the Tuesday, we're going to be in a space called Think Space. And we're going to have a set of topics. You'll see this on your XLEAP uh, platform uh, about the topics. The topics are still evolving because leading up to Alliance, we're actually going to be hosting a set of Think Spaces. This is one of it. The next one I'm going to uh, talk about a little bit later, which will be on December 8th. Um, they're all going to lead us into discussions at Alliance where we're much more interactive in person. Um, but we also know that you have to help us curate the right topics for Alliance. And so the, the topics that we're saying is, hey, we should think about um, sustainability or operations or student centric. Um, we're really going to drive just a different discussion as we move forward. And so we're really excited about it. You're getting your first taste of XSleep. And so that's something that is really um, some exciting for us. So one, we want to say thank you to, um, to, the, to HUG and, and the Alliance team for letting us be a part of the journey. Uh, and we're really excited about you know, engaging with you as we move forward. So. All right. So we're going to go right away. Let me just, um, Christine, do you want to give them a little bit of the rules of the road in terms of how we engage and some of the rules that we normally follow? Sure. This is a space that should be super open and super productive. Uh, I think Matt has a little bit of a reputation for shaking things up, asking questions that might make people uncomfortable about the things they've been doing. It's not to judge anyone as an individual, but really to think about the system that we all exist in and how we might find points of leverage. And that works much better if we hear from people and if we can see people and feel like we are all together in this shared virtual space. So one thing that I will ask everyone to do is to turn on your cameras uh, if you are comfortable with that. And that's just to make us feel like there's more of a group here. I saw some people just do that. Thank you so much. Uh, and part of turning on your camera gives me confidence to invite you into the conversation. So if you are comfortable with chiming in and you want to share something, you can simply put your hand up. It's a really good attentional cue for me. Alternatively, you can use a little Zoom hand raise button. It's faster to do this and a little bit more attention grabbing. The other thing is I am going to invite people into the conversation, maybe on something you've said in the past, maybe on something I know about you because I see some familiar faces. Uh, if you want to pass on that, just go like this and that's fine. We will move on to someone else. But I hope that you'll be inspired to join the conversation because this is much more about collective problem solving and collective solution ideation than it is about anybody up here on stage telling you what to do. Sounds good. And Sounds you should good. use ThinkSpace that Matt has put in the chat again, I believe. 
Yeah, so I'm going to move everyone in the think space into our first exercise. And it's really about the first reason that campuses struggle to modernize is we've never defined what modern means. Even though you all experience modern on a day-to-day basis, um, it's really hard to design something or work on something where you don't actually know what you're really trying to design for. And so we live in a smart retail, smart banking, um, smart venues, smart theaters kind of world. Um, And yet when we walk on campus, we kind of go back to what we all experienced when there wasn't technology, right? And so our goal in this exercise, and and some of my uh, colleagues have gone through this already, some of uh, the folks, so I apologize for those who have gone through this, but it gives us the ability, they're going to be the ones, I'm going to ask them to be chiming in because they've gone through this exercise. Because when they're thinking about changing their campus, they they went through this dialogue of what do we design for? So the first question that I have is, you know, if you were to um, think about Amazon, what do you appreciate about Amazon that you know? Now, you will see that there's these stickies inside of our think space, which has on-demand, intuitive, mobile-friendly, uh, convenient, uh, feels personalized. We, all, we know those are all attributes of the experience that you have at Amazon. But what is it that you appreciate about Amazon? So go ahead and in there, there should be a little plus button on Xleap. Hit the plus button. And then there's a place that says your idea here. Go ahead and enter a few of those topics of what you, there you go. First person, good customer service. That's great. Wow. Quick and easy speed. If you, as you look at these, I want you also to recognize why do you feel that? Is it because it's personalized? Is it because it's friendly? So go ahead and drop and drag those stickies into that. The reason we do that is we need to make sure when we have a conversation with campuses and your campuses is important, you have to recognize, hey, in order to be convenient, we may need it to have uh, better experiences or If there is good customer service, it requires on demand. It requires mobile friendly. This allows, we're now starting to get consensus from you all in terms of what you feel and then what the actual attributes are causing that. A lot of good responses here. So I would say to you, don't put convenient because it's it's already up on top. We already know it's on demand. It's convenient. It's intuitive experience, mobile friendly. It's personalized. Tell us other things that make, why do you like Amazon? And there's a reason why we go there. There's 57 responses, which is great. I love it. I want you to read through this and then go ahead and use those stickies and vote yourself, uh, vote for that. And Christine and and Gabriel chime in as I uh, navigate. I was just going to display um, the XLEAP really quickly and just show them how to vote up if they haven't used XLEAP before. Um, so if you would like to vote up, you can go ahead and, or if you like to apply one of these stickies to one of the responses, you can just go ahead and grab the little circle and then just drag it down, um, to whichever response you'd like to add it to. So it's more of like a click and and drag. And then while people are figuring that out, one thing I would love to know is what is a takeaway from the stuff we're seeing? So does anybody, and I'm going to switch this back into gallery view. And you can all do that by going to view in the top right-hand corner. So we're all together. Uh, What is one thing we can take away from this? Can somebody synthesize what we're seeing? What's important about modernization in this context? Paul, we talked this week. So now you're on my my call list. Paul Gaffney, you want to jump in? And then we'll go to Michelle. Sure. Yeah, it just seems to be all about um, the ease of experience all around. Doesn't present barriers. Yeah, right. So there's less friction, I think, than a lot of other things. So that's something that we can all take away is how do we think about experiences in terms of friction and maybe reducing that uh, to make people enjoy the experience more? Michelle, Horton? I I think um, self-service and the opportunity to uh, utilize automation in a way that feels personalized, that meets your needs. Um, And then when you actually have a 
more challenging problem, there's assistance that can help you navigate a little bit further. But for the most part, you can at any time, um, to to Paul's point, uh, easily access what you need when you need it. And it's not driven by a work schedule of of a company, you know, or, or a particular user. And so there's a lot of autonomy there, right? There's this agency that's associated with it, but it's still buttressed with support, right? It's when I hit a wall, how do I then have those wraparound services that are going to make me feel like there's a real human on the other end who cares about helping me achieve my goals? That's a really great point. No, this is great. So the, this this is ex- exactly what XLeap and our ThinkSpace is. It, it now shows us all the different ideas that you're saying a campus should have. And Michelle, you talked about customer service. And I always ask the question, we get this all the time. You don't always talk to people, right? You don't need people to give you customer service. And yet we always talk about campuses not being able to pick up a phone call, not you know people waiting in line. Like So the reality of it is there's so much technology and the way that they do it and the way they interact with it that you can have really good customer service without the human interaction. That's a that's a takeaway that I always notice when I where I talk about the Amazon experience. Everyone talks about customer service, and we never talk to people, right? So that's a, a that's a great point. So all right, we're gonna go. We're gonna move fast because I got, I think uh, Gabriel is gonna make me move fast through this process. What what is it that when we think about uh, the Uber experience? What is it that you appreciate about your Uber or Lyft experience? So I'll chime in as somebody who is like a oh, virtual classroom picky. Um, whoever shares the screen, it often takes over Zoom and then it makes it hard to go back to ThinkSpace. So I think we should not share the ThinkSpace screen because people probably have it open next to it and then it interrupts that you know frictionless flow. So I, there's a lot coming in here and we can start to debrief that. Yep. Oh, I like door to door. What would it mean to have door to door service in a higher ed context if we're thinking about modernizing a campus? I think it's really meeting the student where they're at, right? Whether they're at home, whether they're on on campus or on grounds. That's uh, that's the analogy I think of door to door. I love that because that's the first door. And then the second door that we're bringing them to is some sort of goal oriented place that they're going on a journey. Right? There are so many metaphors in that. We're meeting students where they're at. We're picking them up. We're bringing them on this journey. And we have a goal. We have a destination that we want to get them to. And that's something that the answer is often a degree, which is such a sad answer in a lot of cases, because the degree is not the thing that's meaningful. It's what that degree represents, what people can do with it, what they can do as humans once they theoretically have it. And so that, I think, is such a powerful metaphor for making this journey really literal. I think to piggyback on that as well, the, you know, Uber, you can add a stop in between, like you could be in the car and add, you know, a new location or things like that. And so I think that definitely is the student journey where you've gone a little bit, you know, gone a semester or two, and now you need to change gears and shift and and move and adapt. And I think part of that is also anticipating that next location where that student needs to be. Um, You know, it might be, hey, let's, let's, Let's get to a pit stop at advising. Let's st- pit stop at the writing center, you know, wherever that might be. So I, I love that door to door analogy. That was great. And what's nice about it is that we define where we get picked up. We might add a stop, we might know where we're going. But really, what the technology is doing is directing us, right? We're not saying, I would like to go three blocks and then make a left and then go four blocks and then I'm going to make a right. It's really the technology that's enabling us to achieve the goal of where we want to get rather than being the destination itself. And that's one thing we see a lot in higher ed where people use technology as a solution rather than as a tool. You know, the one comment that here I see is the easy booking, right? So how easily can we have folks engage with campuses? That's as important too. And right now we go through this admissions process and it takes a long time. The way that campuses are going to have to react is how quickly can you get people engaged into the coursework and the activities of that campus? Uh, we're moving away from the traditional to a non-traditional, which is going to become the traditional technically. Um, I think the ease of booking was a comment here that I thought was really uh, interesting. I also like this cashless transaction. I believe a lot of things are going to have to be like cashless in the way that we interact uh, with a campus also. So that's, that's really good. All right. 
So let's move to the next one. And all of these lead up to certain uh, a topic, but I think Christine's driving it. What, when we experience movies today, um, what is it that you appreciate about movies today? And I know when I grew up, the way I, I consume movies today is not the same. So would love your take on movies and what you appreciate about today's movie going experience. Comfort from home. Yep. Don't have to go anywhere. It's great. Oh, who just said control over environment? I want to know more about that. Sorry, that's me, Jim Russell. <clears throat> Jim, um, tell me about it. So what do you mean? Couple, I'm trying to cover a larger umbrella. Uh, the extraneous sounds of people near you, of babies crying, people walking in front of you, the ability to pause, the ability to control the lights around you. It's really customizing the entire movie experience. And if you want to be an Uber geek, you buy all sorts of nice sound systems and things like that. So it's control over that environment of your movie watching experience. So it's kind of a form of personalization, but it's more than just saying, this is the way I like things. It's having that agentic buy-in, which is something that I think a lot of education is missing. We tell students, this is the way it's going to be, show up at the theater. And what Jim, you're picking up on is the fact that technology might be able to enable us to let students take more agency over where they are going and how they can personalize that experience for them, rather than just showing up and purchasing a curriculum that somebody else has designed, probably not with them specifically in mind. Right. And then there's this great comment about it being multi-sensory and immersive. I just saw the James Bond movie without realizing that I was in a 4K theater until the seat literally shook me. <laughs> I loved about it. It was just such a surprising experience. And what's neat about that from an education design perspective, modernizing a campus, is how do we really produce experiences for students? It's not just, I'm going to stand up here and repeat the same lecture over and over again, but how do I get people to feel like they're part of it? And so that I think is another really important lesson we can take away. And then just to get in, you know, make sure we get into this 15 minutes, you know, getting this covered, the first reason that we haven't defined, we're now defining what modern looks like. So let's go to the next one really quick, which is music. You know, music has evolved in the way that we consume it. Um, what is it that you appreciate about music today? And this is amazing uh, topics. What we will do is uh, after each of these responses for, um, you know, for each reason, uh, we're going to give you a, a little bit of an infographic on what all this means and we will produce that out after the think space. But I just want to know all this means something because there's a lot of ideation going on here. There's going to be a definition that comes out here after we go through this exercise that says, hey, this is what this audience thought modern looked like and feels like. And then the question is, how do we make that a part of a student centric campus? How do we operate differently? How does that you know, culture, uh, campus culture become you know, changed? Even the way that you experience education is a thought, right? And then, of course, like the offerings of it. So this is great. So I accidentally asked Michael to unmute, which was an accident. But since I did, do you want to share some of the ideas about what makes music modern? I think some of the things, things that have already been said, which is, which is your ability to uh, customize it, to curate it, to, to get anything you'd like on, on demand um, and to make it to really personalize it, you know, in a way that it's more, more uh, it's previously been more challenging. And I love that point about curation, because this is one of the really, really unique value propositions that education institutions still have. It used to be that you had to go to campus because that was where knowledge lived in books behind walls in people's heads behind gates. And you had to show up and get it. But this idea of curation is something that we have so much information out there. And students, whatever their age, need that guide that's going to help them walk through it. And I think technology can help enable that, right? We have these features that are new music discovery. Those are things that are really helping us explore to figure out what we're passionate about. Yeah, this is great. So just to close this out, and Christine, thanks for really you know, driving the discussion. When we think about Amazon, it's about a customer-centric kind of mindset. So it's a student-centric ecosystem where you need personal personalization. You need a you know something for everyone, fast response, on demand. It's all there, right? The Uber is there's transparency. There's it's a cashless world. 
we also have to recognize that is a talent ecosystem. It's a gig ecosystem that we have to recognize campuses have to move towards. That's more modern. The way that we work is going to be different. Um, when we think through movies, um, it's about how you experience it, like Christine said. Um, it's personalized. It's it's on your schedule. And I believe that's where learning chemistry comes into play. How do you learn? What's the experience that you need? How do you pause something, right? Time is, is the enemy of the poor, as uh, LeBlanc would say from uh, Southern New Hampshire. And then when we think about music, it's about the offerings, it's the courses. We have to unbundle it. We have to think about how do we stream those. Uh, so these are the ways that we would look at modern in a, in a campus and driving that. I'll see if anyone has any comments before we move to the second reason um, as we go. Okay. And Matt, there was a really interesting um, comment in the chat um, from Christopher. I hope I said your name correctly. Um, but they said, I remember buying CDs and being limited to 1500 songs. And now there's no limit and we can download any music genre, song or album. And so I think that's like a really interesting point too, is that there used to be limits, you know, on a lot of what types of m material could be accessed. But now there is no limit, right? And if we think about how it relates to higher ed, um, that's also becoming more and more true, right? As people are able to access more information from all over the world. So I thought that was a really interesting point. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Thanks, Christopher. Um, we're going to move. Um, I'm going to move you all to the second reason. The second reason it's really hard to modernize is that everyone defines the purpose of higher ed slightly different. Faculty define it a certain way. Students define it a certain way. Employers define it. And when I mean define it, they believe the purpose of, of higher ed is this. And yet we don't align all three of them when we think about how campuses need to modernize. So the, the second reason is higher ed doesn't have a clear manifesto. So I want each of you to go into um, each of these um, green, yellow, and uh, red boxes, enter, and then we're going to walk through some of the things. So what does, in the first one is, what does, what does faculty think the purpose of, of higher ed is? Let's answer that question first. Do you all want to just go into the um, faculty one? Let me see, close all you all and then put here. Are you all there now? There you go. Generation of knowledge, create knowledge. Yep. Critical thinking. Absolutely. Achieving tenure. Yep. Bridge the gap. Prepare students. Awesome. Research. Open minds. Yeah, these awesome. This is great. Christine, being a, a professor, what's your thoughts on this? I put a little bit of a snarky comment in there, which is teach people what I did my PhD research on, uh, which is something that I think we often assign faculty to teach classes that are sometimes in their areas of expertise and sometimes not. And it's almost pretty haphazard what we end up assigning people to. And that's one of the things that I think is difficult about having a manifesto is that the system is not designed to have a unified curriculum. And so that's something that I think we're seeing with lots of diversity and answers, even if the intention is to get people critical thinking skills, we're often assigned to teach something like biology 101 or um cognitive neuroscience for the fusiform face area, right? We go from these really, really broad categories to these really, really specific categories without getting at the thing we're trying to do, which is teach people how to be better critical thinkers. Yeah, some really good responses here. And departmental faculty meetings. That is the purpose of education. No one ever. No, this what is are, Yeah, Matt, go ahead. No, um, all this is like summarizing, you know, faculty really believe they're, their goal is to open minds and, you know, provide knowledge that I'm, I'm a big believer. And I say this when I'm in my faculty sessions, I believe the asset of an institution is the knowledge that it disseminates. And that's where faculty come and play a role in it. And I think we have to get to a place where we become modern, where faculty is being able to disseminate knowledge and that we're able to, you know, tackle that and allow for people to get the knowledge that they need. Um, and I think we got to line that up in some way at some point in time, but this is, this is great. Any other comments? I uh, would love other, other people's thoughts, but this is, I see some interesting ones like award diplomas, right? Like I think there's some folks that are very calculating. Some are, are much more holistic. So, yep. 
I want to push back a little bit on what you said, Matt, about disseminating knowledge. I think that that is useful, but outdated. Again, knowledge is super accessible. I think it has to do with the curation. And Meg, I'm seeing you nod. So do you want to build on that a little bit? What should faculty be doing instead of teaching knowledge? Well, I I couldn't agree more. I think they need to, even at the higher ed, I work nursery through 12th grade, I'm director of innovation. And I think giving them relevance, context, application, uh, colliding with people, actually um, integrating from an omnidisciplinary standpoint, what it is they sit all day in their different classes to do hour by hour. I think, you know, the, what I have two in college right now, and they're biggest complaint is they feel like the coursework that's pre-selected for what it is they want to study is extremely limited and they see connections to other disciplines that they that are out of the scope of what they're allowed to take and so I just think we need to be re-asking ourselves you know especially in k-12 like who are we putting in front of our kids and we're naming them teachers right is it is it just somebody who knows a lot of stuff right in their discipline or is it somebody who can easily connect our, the students in their classrooms with people out in the real world to make that stuff um, visible, right? So it's not about knowledge dissemination in my mind anymore. Yeah, and then Brian Alexander just put in a really interesting point that maybe it shouldn't be about knowledge, but it still is. So there's an attitude and a history there. So Brian, why is that a challenge? Oh, it's a challenge in all kinds of ways uh, because you're trying to help faculty adapt to a future that they really weren't prepared for and that many of them practically don't see as having arrived. Uh, It also means that they are very personal and think, well, maybe you can get all this information online, but you can't get the real stuff, which is what I provide. And so, I mean, those two differences are really powerful at blocking collaboration and blocking changes in pedagogy. I'm not saying they're accurate. I'm simply saying those attitudes are really widespread. Yeah. And that, I think, is an important bottleneck in the system. It's very easy to say we shouldn't be filling people with knowledge. We should be igniting skills so then they can go out and create new knowledge and share that with other people and give them tools rather than information. But acknowledging where we are in the present is a really important way to figure out how to fix stuff. So let's let's move. Uh, and you got to see Think Space at its best, right? Christine totally disagreed with me. We went on another and I'm wrong, right? I I may not be the right. I may not have said it the right way. I I may be uh, on left field. That's the great thing about ThinkSpace. We get to disagree. Uh, And I'm sure there's different opinions all over the place. So, but this is why ThinkSpace is important because too far, we've been just listening to a one-way conversation. We've never been able to challenge anyone. And now, you know, I learned something. Meg gave me some context, right? Brian stepped in and this is how we grow as we move forward. So that's great. Okay. Let's, let's, let's think about students now. And when I think about students, I'm going to ask the same question. And I love the fact that you all have moved ahead and went into students. Um, Let's, let's add parents to this mix. I, I purposely didn't want to confuse you all by putting parents and students. When we think about students, we also got to recognize what parents' influence is on that student. So go ahead and um, put your responses here. And just an FYI, we will be drawing three names from the folks who are in the X-Sleep um, for $25 gift cards. Uh, just an FYI, we'll, Gabriel uh, will we'll show a fancy little spinner and, and get that going. Just an FYI. We are working with that. Uh, so that's why we have three moderators. We're, we're all doing something. And then we have Hector in the background, you know, producing this in the background. So, Christine, I'm going to, if you can just take this, I'm going to finish up. Yeah, it's, there's so many good things coming in. And what I think is really, really interesting is to compare what students think the definition of college should be to the faculty. So has anyone seen anything that overlaps? There's a few of them. Ellen, what do you got? Ellen Cantor, any overlapping intersections between the faculty and the student perspective? I guess. There we go. I thought maybe I thought maybe you unmuted me. Uh, hi. Um, I, I find a lot that are not uh, overlapping, such as find your soulmate. Um, but there's a lot around work and gaining gainful employment. That's one that strikes me dramatically as overlapping. Um, I don't see, you know, it's interesting. I don't know that students think of themselves as the one I was just about to write when you called on me was um, having fun with learning uh, and gaining a better ability, you know, rounding out that learning, um, which, you know, can take a long, take a lifetime uh, to have fun with it and enjoy it. Uh, so that was one I was just about to put in. That's Thank sad you. that that was not on the faculty one either. It's such a beautiful point, right? That 
Yeah. The brain was designed to learn. Your brain's job is to predict the future. It's the only job in the world to do it in a very energy efficient way. And so if your brain's superpower is to learn, part of what people should be seeking in an education is a way to make that enjoyable and fun. Uh, Niraj, and you have to tell me if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, because if I did, I need name karma so people don't call me Professor Loser. <laughs> it's pretty close. Uh, so What is it? It's very close. So I, I will not mind it. So that's totally fine. Uh, so I, I want to make a point here. I'm currently a student and uh, I'm doing my master's in higher education. And what I see is students are very focused on their grades and points because they, and I personally think I've worked with higher ed for 14 years and plus, is like our whole system is designed around grades and it's an administrative system, how you manage and work with grades. And everybody in the class is working to get a grade and focused on a grade and not on their actual learning. So instructors saying this, how I get a good grade, this is what I need to put in place. And on top of that, this administrative system has stretched so much that all the financial aid, the funding that you get is everything tied to these units and grades. And it has totally shifted from student learning to, um, to grade system. I think it looks like to me when I look at higher education systems, they're just maintaining grades and getting funding from the higher education uh, from federal government or state government. And the learning is somewhere left behind where students are focused, what they love to learn. And so I want to hear people's thought about this grading system and uh, all about this, because I think <laughs> some people don't make the grade, they spend money and then they don't get out of it anything. So it's a really, really important point. Larry, you want to build on that? Yeah, there's a significant. Well, we've trained our students to be taskmasters and not innovators and individual thinkers. And so I apply an individualized grading system based on the student's ability. So not every student gets the same grade. It's based on their ability. Can you show me? Can you prove to me that you've grown, that you've added new knowledge and depth based on your ability, not based on what the class is producing, but compared to what where you started to where you grew to. And I let all my students know that they hate it because they're task master. They want to know what do I have to do to get the A? And it's really shifted how I grade. So I'm much more um, to the point of individualized grading um, compared to a holistic side. Larry, I would argue, I'm sorry. Larry, I would argue that they that students have been conditioned, right, to, to be those taskmasters since grade school, right, all the way through grade school and, and, and high school. And, um, you know, we unfortunately in this, at least in this country, we, we teach students how to take tests as opposed to really imparting knowledge a lot of the time. So I love the fact that you're individualizing the, the learning mechanism here. Um, but it's it's certainly in you're in the minority, which is and then one of the things about being in the minority is that the system is conditioning students in this way. So when they reach something that might actually be good for them, like a personalized grading system or like involving students in active learning, like this isn't how this works. And then there's some reactants rather than acceptance of something that will actually make them like learning and understand how to embrace their education. Jessica, you want to jump in? Sure, yeah, and kind of piggybacking, and I don't know if this will be a solid thought, but, you know, in the chat here, we're saying a lot of um, the student perspective was getting a job, getting that degree to get the job. And I think going, you know, tying that with the grading and being a taskmaster, the, the issue I see or like the challenge is getting those students the experience they need to actually go out and apply what they've learned or even just make you know strategic decisions or adapt to um, the challenges in the workplace in their life etc so it's kind of like a society issue I guess like what are we actually teaching in school and who where is that balance between sharing experience uh, or I guess a safe place you have an experience where you can take the things that you've learned from, you know, an action um, that you've gone through. You know, I think um, I started, for example, as a work study student, and I'm so such an advocate for the work study programs on campus, because that is actually what enabled me to apply skills that I did learn through college and then, you know, and beyond. Um, so I think that type of, you know, I guess, teaching through, through, I keep saying experience is, is key. So. 
No, experiential learning is exactly the right word you should be using, right? It's about experience. And that's something that students are looking to get. And it's something that very, 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 very rarely enters the faculty lexicon. They think that teaching happens inside of walls that I get to stand at the front of a room and share knowledge about rather than really having people bring their experience into the classroom, go out into the world, come back and kind of use that as a practice thing. Mm -hmm. Denise, do you want to jump in on... Jessica, I'm just going to like get to the two people with the hand raises, but drop your thought in chat and we'll circle back around to it. Denise? Well, I just wanted to build on that. Not only is it about um, the students basically going to school and regurgitating what they're taught in class to get their grades, but it's also almost the the universities, the, the colleges have become an assembly line. It, we say it takes four years to get a student in and out. You will You will graduate in four years. As a freshman, my daughter was pushed to declare her major. And you will graduate in four years. And I said, no, you can take five years. You can take six years. And you don't know what you want to do when you graduate because you're a freshman and you're 17 years old. And her counselor would push her. And I think we need to get out of the, I know universities are a business, but we need to get out of the concept of treating the kids like they're on an assembly line and getting them in and out because that's what gets us the points. That's what gets the universities the recognition at a at a national level that we have the success by getting our kids out in four years um, and go back to treating the students as students. She's in a master's program now that treats her completely different and she no longer has ulcers. She no longer is uh, 10 pounds underweight and pasty white and orange eyes and all of the health conditions she had as a regular college student have gone because the master's program she's in is treating her as an adult who's going to school while she's working and taking her lifestyle into account. Yeah, that's so important. Totally different experience. Yeah, it's really changing sort of health and well-being in an important way when you embrace the whole person. We're going to go to Michelle and then I think we're going to skip over to administrators and compare the differences there. This is a- Michelle, last thought. This employer is just an FYI. Yeah, I just wanted to to chime in and dovetail in with what has been said and the fact that um, our society is set up now that it must be a conveyor belt to get students through. And the students have no choice but to think of it as such, because when they're worried and they're working set jobs to get through college, they don't have time to say, oh, this is going to be great to have this, this self-individualized grading system. It's like, no, what is the bare minimum I need to do to get through? Because I have another job. I, I, can, I can spend an hour on homework for this class tonight. What is it I need to do? We're not giving them that benefit. And the colleges are like that. The faculty is like that. I mean, these kids are worried about far more than just their their learning. I mean, I work at a very goes, prestigious private institution and we have a food bank. You know, I think it goes it back to kind of treating the whole student. How do we have wraparound services? How do we meet them where they're at? Back to that Uber metaphor. And then this is a really nice transition point. So Mary, I'm going to ask you to drop your thought in the chat to what administrators, sorry, employers, is employers, employers is employer, yeah. Ah, okay. So what do they think people are getting out of college when they have a college degree? Really interesting stuff in here. And, and we did have a administrator tab. We, we took that out because we thought we needed to focus on the three because we thought faculty would work with administrators closely. So that's why the employers won. So what are we seeing in here that's unique from what students and faculty think is actually happening? Maybe, Mary, I can actually ask you to help me out because I do want to know your thought from before as well. So a lot of soft skills are, are being talked about. This, and then the skills labor. So if you think about the first conversation we had with faculty, everything was about knowledge. And, and yet at the industry, we're now talking about skills and talent and, and specialization. They're going into the granular element of it. And these students are in the middle of it, right? And that's where I think we're trying to figure out how do we do that? And we're going to have to move to the next uh, reason soon, Christine, just that we get through all five of our reasons. I think the short way to summarize this is that so many people have a different definition of what the manifesto is, and it's hard to modernize if people are not aligned, right? You really need higher ed should have a clear message about what it's doing. But the real takeaway is that an institution needs to have that clear message. We're talking about higher ed almost as averaging across many institutions. And I think that that is muddy. But even if we were to think about a single institution, you would see very different things as well. 
And that's what the blocking point is, is there is an alignment on purpose, mission, and vision that seems to match for all audiences. So Matt, do you want to do the third reason? Yeah, just moved right to it right now. Um, The third reason is the landscape is changing. It's shifting. So the question here is, these are the items, right? So uh, it's student-centric. It's shifting to a more of a student-centric. There is this non-traditional learner. There's this online education that's really becoming a part of the discussion, hybrid campus. We're having conversations with presidents about making themselves a hybrid com- uh, campus. The demographics are sh- changing. We're moving from this traditional high school student to a lifelong learning student, which is much more uh, a different di- um, de- demographic. Credentials are becoming a discussion. Do we need it? Is, is degrees the only thing we do? Or is it uh, personal, personalized learning, and then the educational marketplace, which is really aligned to the future of work, and then uh, competency-based education, which Southern New Hampshire and others are really focused on. These are all the shifts that we're seeing. Are there any that we're missing? Anybody? Are we missing something here? Because I'll add it to the list here if we're missing something. But while we're doing that, tell us how higher ed addresses it. Is it through policy? Is it through technology? Is it through culture? Is it even addressing the operational model? One, the first question is, are we missing any? Anybody? There were some good ones in the chat. Yep. Terrence just called out critical thinking as a basic tenet of something that should actually be in a landscape that maybe is not. And then, Peter, do you want to comment on globally integrated? I think that's really interesting. We, we live in a, a, an increasingly, seemingly small you know, world on one hand, and then, of course, it fractures in various social groupings on the other. But uh, th- that higher level of integration that enables people around the globe to be interconnected is something that we also want to train students to, to handle. And we know the workforce wants that, too. So there's something about that element that's moved beyond, you know, 300 years ago, training folks for the local priesthood kind of thing. I love that because it goes back to what liberal arts was supposed to do. Liberal arts was founded to let free thinking citizens who existed in a democracy have the skills that they needed to be a voting populace, right? It was really driven by trying to not do something that is about any particular discipline. It's These are the core critical thinking skills. And in 2000 and whatever, that means being a member of a global world, which is so important. Naraj? Yeah, I think one category as all the analysis and research says, the freshman students are reducing year by year and the enrollments are declining. So, in the changing landscape, where the institutions who are only run by the tuition as, as their main revenue source, that's also something changing in the land, uh, higher ed landscape, how those institutions will survive in coming years. Um, where the institutions, those are providing the same education in an online way and other ways. So I think that's going to be a challenge in coming year if we don't have enough students to keep our business running and how we tackle that problem. Yeah, so Nuraj, I just added that in and I also added global integration in. Uh, Terry, which one was yours really quick? Because I could add yours in too. Was it, uh, do you remember? Uh, critical thinking. Critical thinking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have a lot of people talking about costs. Go ahead, Gabriel. Yeah, so I was going to say that it looks like uh, Char- Charlie, I hope you're saying it correctly, um, put in mental health and well-being as well in the chat, which I think is really connected to also this idea of putting this, the, the uh, student first and kind of what Christine had touched on before is, you know, really approaching um, education with that holistic um, approach. How about affordability for costs? That's what I put it. Okay. No, this is great. So go ahead and and use your vote ups, uh, your votes, your uh, stickies to how do we address this? Because I'd I'd like for us to like, I'm going to sort them based on some of these. Because I want to say, is it the operating model that's having to shift here? Or is it the policies that we have to? So go take a couple, you know, 30 seconds to a minute. I'm going to put 30 seconds on the clock for silence. Perfect. Very intimidating. No, this is great. So just just some kudos to everyone. We have, we have about 107 uh, people in, in the Zoom. We have 80, 88, 89 people in XSleep. That means, you know, the 10 of us who aren't in XSleep right now, the fact that you all are engaged is, is amazing. Uh, I love the dialogue. This content can be shared with you all. So if you want this type of content, you want to see it, 
Uh, this is your content because you're helping us develop it. So we, we're willing to share this with you at any point in time. Um, but we will also do a summary uh, as we go. So just an FYI, um, I'm going to sort if you all don't mind. I want to, and I want to sort on one particular thing. We were at Educause uh, two weeks ago, and the conversation we all had was around culture. So I'm going to sort around culture really quick. So student centric became it's a cultural thing, right? Uh, demographic shift, you have to address it with culture, critical thinking. Uh, non-traditional learners, lifelong learning, all these are cultural things that you want to do. Now, let us let us let me do it with operating model. Operating model is affordability. That's, that's really true. Non-traditional learner, we have to rethink that. Operating model it has to be online education, personalized learning. That's awesome. Now, let, let's look at technology. This is where I come from. This is what my world has been for the past 20 years. Hybrid campus. Yes. So that's great. So yeah, in order to become a virtual and a complementary campus where you do both, your technologies have to play a role. Online education, personalized learning. How about policy? Credentials. Yeah, I think they're accreditation, affordability, non-traditional. Okay. Okay. Christine and Gabriel, you're okay with me moving? Any last comments? Because I want to get to reason four. I think we're in good time. We got we're we're, we're going to be at uh, reason four. I see. I guess one thing to do yeah. with these is to sort of think about what campuses can actually do about them. Yep. Okay, like you can address it with these, but how might you do that? And we don't have to dig into that discussion because it'll take you know like seven more years. But just giving people that frame of reference, that kind of engagement prompt, it's you could address it with this, but make sure you have something tangible in mind that you're walking away with about why you think you put that dot in that place. So four is an interesting place to go. But I do want to kind of recap these, right? This idea that we don't have any definition of modernization. We don't have a manifesto because there is very poorly aligned agreement about what college is for. And then the landscape shifts really, really quickly. And so when we think about the next one, I'm going to let Matt jump in and contextualize it for us. Yeah. So the next one, reason four is culture impacts direction. And I make the statement all the time in my in my vision se- se- sessions is that we can drive all these strategies. We could adopt new CRMs. We can adopt the the dashboard of the future that gives us all these insights. We can put a a new cloud product in, but culture will eat up any of those strategies. So one of the questions that I, and like I said, this was coming from just our last conference we were at that everyone kept saying the biggest issue is not the technology. It's not what we're doing. It's the culture for what we do. So the question I have is, I'm going to move you all here, close. As you notice, I have a little bit of control uh, as I close others out. Um, And I'll open these other, other sessions back up later. What are the mindsets that we have today on campus that impact the culture on campus? And you'll see that there's some vote ups here. I put three for right now. But what are the mindsets today that impact your culture? Collective borrowing agreement. Okay. Fixed mindset, closed minds, competition. So go ahead and also vote up. I'm going to actually increase your vote ups to more than three because I just, I want to see which ones you all agree. There's so many good responses. Vote up 10 that you believe we should all focus on in terms of culture. This will help us drive the discussion. Matt, can we drag the the names over them because so many people are converging on the same one. Yeah, we could, I can move, uh, I can move things over. So traditional, I can move in. Very cool tool. Yeah. So we will condense them. So even if you vote somewhere, we will move them together. It's just on the fly. It's a little bit hard. But, I know but that feeling producing and yeah. facilitating at the same time. The, so this, the, it, it's not the technology. It's Matt Alex being slow. You know, the one here, number nine, wow, and it's getting votes, bingo, is this culture of fear. Now, uh, we have this discussion at many of our campuses. Um, I would love a little bit of, of what that means to who all are voted. There's nine of you that have agreed to say, hey, there's a culture of fear. And this also goes to some of the clients I work with. Like, this is so common. I would love your thoughts on what a culture of fear and how that's impacting you. Go ahead, if anyone wants to chime in. And the folks that don't like to chime in, don't want to jump on a, uh, 
go ahead and even type it in. It's totally fine. Yeah. One of the things that I think I see in that culture of fear is change threatens my job, right? People think that if we change the way we do something or change a product that somehow they're going to be unemployed. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's kind of a, a, a false assumption to me. I mean, there's always more work than we can get done. But I think that is a prevailing feeling that people have. And I want to add to that feeling is like, I think it depends upon the individual leaders who are pushing for that change. If they're not enabling the people there and they're saying, I'm doing the change, but I'm not helping you train. I'm not developing your skill set. And there's also some employees there in that stage of their career that say, I'm not ready for learning. But I think that open discussion has to happen when that change happened that, hey, I'm going to help you learn this. And it's going to be actually an added value to your resume or to your skill set over the time because it's something new. So I think a lot of schools just push the change, but does not invest, I think is, is a bigger problem. I, I M- Michael, I think your loss of control and uh, is, a you know, the power there. There, a lot of us live in what, what I would call the incumbent world. This is my world. This is what I, I know. Uh, I'm going to lose my control. Um, I, I think organizations that put out a vision, what your why is, and you're all pushing towards that, allows for that culture to say, we all own this together. It's not one a one particular element. Um, and, when we're, and the next reason, I'm going to dive deeper in a little bit of this, but you 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 all are hitting a lot of things. There's an elite mindset. Like I, this is my title. Like I always say, there's a lot of title inflation all over the place, and they and that using that title inflation to control your you know your staff um, is 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 a cultural issue. Um, I know in the when the pandemic was happening, I would have people call me and say, hey, how do how do we address the remote workforce? I, I need to. You know, they, I got to make sure they're productive. And I said, that's a trust issue. You know, you, you got to hire people. You have to trust them, enable them, and they will work. They will walk through walls for you. And I think uh, the pandemic has now said, hey, let's start trusting people. I think most campuses will tell you that when you gave them a little bit of agency to to do what they know, um, they felt empowered to to create that culture so um it's an interesting topic there good some really good ones can i if you don't mind man there's 48 of them can do you mind uh, i'm going to give you 20 seconds to vote up because i i want to pull the ones on top um and then we got a good 20 minutes for the another set of uh X. well matt's dragging and dropping i think it's pretty mm-hmm. clear that one of the ones that was interesting was silos this idea that people work in disciplines. Maybe I want to explain why that would impact culture or what culture does it impact? And that's going to go straight to the next reason, but that's awesome. So keep going with it. Here I am making transitions. That's great. So you have the status. Go ahead. I saw you pick up a water bottle, which I thought was a hand. I got excited to call on you. Did you want to give us some context for sort of why disciplinary silos impact culture? Caught me on the spot, didn't you? Um, silos. Well, I didn't vote that one up, but, um, I could, I suppose. Um, Hey, Kurt, you, you work in the PeopleSoft ecosystem. You, there's silos all over the place. Tell me the right, reason. Could, yeah. yeah. So, you know, from my perspective, I am, um, a software developer. So I'm looking at it from the technology standpoint and, um, you know, I would say from, Transactional user experiences, um, silos can exist around uh, outdated backend processes that are slowing things down, that are affecting student success. Um, and so in my field, I'm looking for ways to break those down uh, into more micro transactions and trying to, to drive you know, student success again is kind of where I'm focusing on right now. To break the silos of the the traditional slow back end um, back office processing that that slows things down for students. I love that because student success is an emergent property of all of the different functions of a university if they are acting together in concert. Right, that's the outcome we want. But we operate in departments for educational topics, or we operate in business units for different parts of the university that are serving different parts of the student. And that, I think, is really a barrier to getting to that outcome. It's also a barrier 
sort of innovation. Those are the things that mismatch between the way people function and the way organizations function. So that's a really great point. Larry, you want to jump in? Yeah. So this happens to be in my doctoral thesis, uh, discussing this very topic because there's such a huge disparity gap between uh, what employers expect uh, students to be able to do upon graduation and then what the way that education is designed, you know, prior to 1940, largely in the universities and colleges operated it in a holistic kind of manner. Prior to the 40s, then we switched to these silos and it's driven by budget where, you know, uh, each department now has is teaching credits or funding their school. And, you know, so they're now it's about student capture. How many students can I get to take my classes to help fund the things that I need to do to fund uh, pay to uh, for my professors. And so we're, we switch strategies as to use it as a funding mechanism rather than an educational focus. And so from a, from a school standpoint, the suffer, the students suffer now because they're not getting the interactive experience and the expertise from other fields that were enabling them to think more broadly, to think about across disciplines and to use the expertise across campus. So now we're operating in the silo of just what, uh, what's the best my silo has to offer. Which is such a sad, short changing of reality, right? I used to hate this phrase, we operate in the real world versus a school that's not real. But school has this artificial unreality to it because problems are interdisciplinary and school tends to be very much in these silos. Jessica, last thought on this one before we pick one more. Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, I think this has all fostered this an internal competition where you believe you're, you and your department are unique and therefore like creating these unique processes, creating these unique uh, well, my people are better, or we're bringing the most students, or we're competing for the students, has um, therefore created this loneliness where it creates this fear on the campus where we are not going to change. And then it turns into um, knowledge hoarding where I'm the only one that knows this in my department. I can't share it. Otherwise, that's a fear of my, like, I will be gone or they're going to change this. So um, it's definitely a full circle in, in all of these items that have been brought up. Yeah, what I love about that is just connecting all of these, right? It's like these don't exist in silos either. It's really this feeds into that, that impacts this. And there's really this dynamic to all of these problems continually impacting the other problems. So I'm going to turn over to Matt to decide if we should do one more, maybe this risk version one, or if we should move on to reason five. Yeah, so I'm just looking at the clock. You know, I just wanted to sort these and just have a discussion about the top, you know, the higher, higher, you know, the rankings in in itself. It's it's unique because when we were thinking about diving deeper, uh, being unique was was one of the things that we talked about. Um, I can't tell you the number of engagements that we get on and and everyone goes through this. And we're going to do uh, another think space in December that's going to dive deeper. But everyone says we're unique. And then the reality of it is they're not that unique in the way that they do it. But it, that culture creates a lot of just uh, angst in terms of changing from that. Um, so just uh, I wanted to just talk to that. So the, the, the culture of fear was the highest that bubbled up. Risk averse. This is similar to culture of fear. People are, are risk averse because they're accountable for something. There's a lot of people that have ownership to certain things. They're they're afraid. I know the financial aid side would be risk averse in a lot of cases, right? Because that is putting a lot of jeopardy in, in spaces. There's a lot of that. Um, this number 25 is interesting. The lack of a modern skill in employee and faculty. I think professional development is something that lacks on campuses. And I think that is something that in order to change culture, you have to get people to experience things differently. We're hoping that this think space is giving you an idea of, hey, let's think differently. Even meetings should be done in a different way than you do. Um, so that's a, a discussion. Everything is is somewhat slow, right? We're going to go there in, in one second. Uh, the politics, we, of course, see that all the time. Um, we do it the way it has always been. So, and then the silos comes in and then outdated processes. Love it. Okay. I just wanted to tackle those Christine really quick because I thought it was, uh, important for us to bubble those up. So let's move 
to the last reason. So the 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 one the one before was reason four was culture impacts direction, and you you've identified all the reasons there. Um, the next one is reason five: operating at college speed. And I use the word college speed is everyone operates in terms. They operate by meetings. They have everyone needs to be a part of a discussion. So everything takes time. Even getting a meeting sets up, you have a meeting to have a meeting. So I want to ask the question, what gets in the way of agility for an agile campus? What's What gets in the way of an agile campus? What are the things that slow you down? And there you go. Risk aversion comes right up on top. Managed by committees. Yeah. Shared governance. Awesome. I'm going to also increase this to 10 because I think there's a lot of good responses here. 10. And we're about 15 minutes away from closing. We like to close it. And for the folks that haven't uh, been in any of our other sessions before, we uh, end and then we usually have a what we call a post mingle where we can dive in and people can talk and, and there's a lot of collaboration for about 30 minutes after. Sometimes it goes an hour. Uh, so we welcome you to stay even after we're done uh, because there's a lot of content here. We can't dive in as, as quickly as possible, but there's a lot of deep dives here that I think at Alliance, we're going to dive deeper into some of these topics uh, because we I think there's things that we have to think about and it requires more than 90 minutes to have a conversation. So this is good. And while we're doing that, um, Gabrielle, do you want to announce the winners, the first one by chance? Yes. Um, I Do you want me to show the wheel when I spin it? Or do you mean to just spin it? It's up to you. If you want to show them the cool wheel, I'm all about cool wheels. Okay. Show the wheel. Show the wheel. All there right. Let's show it. Um, yes. Yeah, so we included um, the, the participants um, on X Leap a certain moment in time. And then I just try to add as many people as I could to it who were speaking and also participating um, in Zoom. So let me go ahead and share this. This is so exciting. I love giving away Starbucks gift cards. <laughs> okay, here we go. Let's see who our first winner is. All right, Patricia Clay. Is Patricia Clay in the house? Patricia here? We can, uh, we can, we can, we can find her. We have an email on her. Yes, so. we need to send all right. So you want a $25 gift card? Let's, Let's see. do one more. Yeah. All right. Shama? Kevin in the that house? That's a fake applause. It is. We, we, we I all feel like I'm a wheel of fortune. Time, so. All right. And we'll do one more later? Yeah, we'll do one in the end. Okay. All right. Perfect. There you go. Woo. <laughs> So if I'm reading these correctly, one of the big ones that has been upvoted most is politics. I feel like people have a lot of thoughts about, and I'm seeing odds on the screen. Anybody want to jump in and give that a little bit more context and color? Why might that be something that gets in the way of an agile campus? And if that answer is super obvious to people, maybe say something about how you might reduce that. Karen, Karen, you look like you want to share. Oh. So I guess the way that I have tried to work to reduce that is to build bridges. So kind of my own personal network, the network that does not bubble up to the surface, right? So reaching out and um, meeting with people and really kind of grassroots efforts seems to be the best thing so far. Politics and relationships often kind of fight each other. Politics are about individual striving for certain things as opposed to me looking at the situation and saying, what I want to do is build a system together. And that's where relationships can be a really powerful way to get over this sort of political infighting that I think a lot of large institutions and even small ones often see. And and Karen, you're part of the, the HUG mentoring group, right? Do you address that in your mentoring group and how you you mentor people through that process of dealing with politics? So we haven't thus far, but we're actually in the process right now of revamping that entire program. There you go. I'm going to make a note. <laughs> yeah. I, as soon as I saw your, your, uh, your, you start speaking, I realized that you probably have influence in, in shifting that. So that's great. Awesome. Good, good. Um, everyone vote because I want to just do a vote up really quick so that I could um, sort. Everyone done? So I have been plotting out. So I hope the votes don't change where I'm ending, which is that the next highest one is my favorite thing on this entire list to kind of wrap up this conversation with. 
and it's too much talking without action. So that is sort of the point of this, although we spent the whole time talking rather than doing. Uh, so what are some things we can take away from this session that can actually turn into act? Oh, Gabrielle, you unmuted. And then we'll go to Nora. Oh. Go ahead, Nora. Yeah, go ahead, Nora. <laughs> uh, opening up of the minds that maybe we aren't doing things the best way. Maybe we need to do things differently. Maybe we need to relook at things. Uh, to me, the whole experience has been very much rethinking the way we think. Yeah, I think Matt does this really nice job of taking us on this journey by giving us really, really tangible examples to begin with. We get really nitty gritty with yes. the things that other people are doing for modernization. And it's like, oh, wait, there's an analogy here. I can apply this in this direction. So that's a really nice takeaway. Absolutely. My my uh, my uncle was a bishop, you know, so he was a preacher. So he talked in stories, Christine. And I learned that story that the art of storytelling and aligning, you know, other stories to what we really ought to do. I'm far from being a preacher like that, but uh, I did. Narratives are super powerful. Yeah. And my and my niece is in the house and and she can tell you that if if higher ed conversation comes in, she knows how to walk out the door very fast. It's good. All right. So this has been really good. I mean, uh, any last comments? I know we're we're in the we'd like to ask a couple of questions to close out some things. Um, part of what we're going to do, to be honest with you, under each one of them, there's exercises. There's a deep dive under each one of these that um, that we can hash out. We just don't have in the 90 minutes. We just don't have a lot of time. So in the pre mingle, if you decide to stay, I will open up the uh, the deeper dive in each of these. But I think this is what I think we need to start doing even at Alliance is to dive deeper in some of these discussions. And I, and I, and I like to understand what are the things that we're missing? Christine is trying to hone in on this and she does an amazing job of all this talk. What do we need to do next? Right. And I think part of that is one, we may not, maybe the next iteration, we don't do five reasons. Maybe we do three. But I thought these five was really important, to be honest with you. And it sets up the landscape for the conversation we're going to have. We have four more think spaces that's going to come up. And we're going to dive into some, some topics uh, that are really important. And I, I want to just talk about that really quick. And then um, we will be doing our next think space in collaboration with the League for Innovation uh, so Brittany and, and her team and, and the HUG team is, is actually partnering with the League for Innovation, which is a set of community colleges, and they're going to do the next session. I'm not sure if you can see this. Uh, it is around the topic of implementing real change. We talked about all this talk. Why does implementations never meet expectations? You all have been through implementations, and a majority of you will say it never met the expectation. And there's a lot of uncomfortable conversations we're going to have during that time. Um, I want each of you to join us. I want you to call your friends because in order, in order for us to really change how we operate moving forward, and the hug is going to be a really important part of that. You all are a part of that discussion because you, are, you all are part of, of the process of that transformation. And I want, if you can attend this, this would be great. Uh, it is going to be, we moved it out to two o'clock so that the, the Pacific folks aren't waking up early in the morning. So uh, we're, we're going to try to move it around. We also had Christine who, I don't know if you know this, but Christine is coming in from Barcelona. So I needed to give this at a time where she was um, available for us. So, um, but I hope you all can attend and I'm going to, one, I want to stop there, see if we have, I want to ask these two questions. We normally do this with all of our sessions. I think this would be good. What did you like about this Think session, Think Space session? And then we're going to have another one that's a little bit opposite of this. So what are the things that you liked about this Think Space session? And the reason I ask this question is we're trying to figure out what experience looks like and feels like for you. And does this work for you? Number seven, good facilitation. That's, you know, I know how to delegate my facilitation. That's why I bring in Gabriel and Christine into these things, you know? So Matt, you undercut your skills. And we own no stock in XSleep, just an FYI. We just happen to look for a tool and, and they're, they've been a good partner with us. So uh, I'm sure they'll like seeing that. Uh, and you will see that um, 
Next, B Next Studios has been producing this. So the the recorded version is going to be, you'll see it uh, up on the on the top. You'll see that we're being produced, and that will be the recording that we will share with you because we believe that. So if you got up on stage, you're going to be on a nice little presentation layer. Because uh, we want people to recognize that we also have to create these experiences that that feel good, that feel like a part of a conversation. And so we did that uh, with Hector and his team, uh, who's coming from Mexico. So we have we we brought the whole global world into this mix here. So this is some really good thoughts. We really appreciate it. Um, and we but now the next question is. As important, what do you think we can do to improve your think, hug think space experience? What can we do better? Because remember, we have four, one, four after this, and then at Alliance, we're going to do this in person. So, and our feelings will not be hurt. Not at all. Oh, number one, that Christine wanted to do breakout rooms. I did. She it's did. Okay. And, I, and I said, this is our first one. We got a lot to cover. I don't know if we're breakout room, but... Well noted. Christine, was that you? Did you put that I didn't in? even type that in. I wish I had. I wish I was that quick. Look, breakout rooms. All right. People like breakout rooms. I think this is a really nice introductory session where we're trying to introduce a story arc. And the thing with breakout rooms, which sounds uh, like people are interested in it, is that will be a part of the next ones. And that's always kind of the plan is we want to lay out a landscape to get people really excited, kind of do this fast paced lightning round, and then dig into each one of these topics in a more close personal setting where we'll have time to reflect with each other and then with a broader group. Yeah, this is great. And, and these are great feedbacks. We will definitely look at it. We'll work with the hog and, and them on this and also the League for Innovation for the next couple. Um, but one, I want to stop here and ask Gabriel to do the last. Uh, um, winner, and Absolutely. then we'll close okay. it out. We'll close it out, and then we'll open up our post mingle. And then, um, all right, oh, we got the crystal play again. I don't know how that happened. Hold on, second. Let me shuffle it. Let me shuffle it. it. You think Patricia Patricia needs to play again? the lottery today? I know, seriously, Jessica Holler. I think Jessica's from Chicago. I could probably hand it over to her. Oh, you could. All right. Holler. We'll all, our, all three of our winners. Yay. So, well, I know we're at the <laughs> bottom you. of the hour. I want to respect everyone's time. I told you the 90 minutes is going to go pretty quick. Um, one, I, I want to first say thank you to the hug for letting us be a part of this. Uh, we're really dedicated to really transform how the hug moves forward. They're really thinking about being innovative. We want to be a part of that. We believe some of the things we did today and a lot of the things that we did in the discussion has to apply to the hug too, right? So while we talked about universities and colleges, some of it is, hey, let's let's incorporate this within the hug a little bit too. And I think that's going to be a really good conversation as we move forward. Our door is always open. If you have ideas, you have thoughts, um, suggestions, we want to know because we believe that it's ongoing uh, and we're really excited that you're you're being you're being here uh, through this process. I want to especially thank Christine Loser from uh, Minerva University. For the folks that don't know Minerva University, um, they're probably one of the most innovative universities. They've been around for about ten years. Just got uh, credited. I got to go to their graduation, and their graduation was nothing like we would ever go to. I was actually challenged, and and I remember walking out of that graduation, which was virtual. And saying, wow, these people just blew my mind. So instead of me seeing them pick up a diploma, I got to hear what they learned. And it was, it was, I, I was very grateful for Christine to, to invite me to that. And I want to say thank you, Christine, for joining, uh, joining us here. And I want to say thank you for organizing and thank you to everyone who attended. I think one of the things about facilitation is you can't do it very well by yourself. So I very much appreciate everybody who chimed in and who tolerated me inviting you into the conversation, which is just cold calling rebranded. But I think that that's such an important thing to be able to do with people who care about an important topic is use dialogue, which actually comes from, if you break down the word, meaning through. That's what it 
gets at is we can get to a place of mutual understanding through each other. And that is something I'm really passionate about and so grateful that you all took the time out of your day to share that with us. Thank you, Christine. And also, uh, Gabrielle, thank you for jumping in. Gabrielle has been designing this with me for the past few days. She's uh, had to go had to go through a lot of iterations with me. You know, my mind works so different than others. Uh, so she puts up with me in, in a lot of ways. So Gabrielle, thank you for uh, driving me towards this uh, design. So appreciate it. Uh, Brittany, any words or Michael, any last words? I'll let you all close out. Uh, thank you for the time and everyone who's been here. I'll let Michael or, or Brittany uh, close us out. So Matt, this was my first chance to get to participate in one of these. And I can tell you, I, I'm blown away too. I, this this was fantastic. I, I really enjoyed the session and I, I look forward to, to jumping into a lot more. Thank you, Michael. We appreciate it. Everyone else, whoever's going to leave, thank you for the folks that are going to stay. Uh, we look forward to having uh, more conversations with you all. Thank you. This Think Space was in partnership with HUG, the Higher Education User Group. ThinkSpace is powered by Beyond Academics. It is produced by BeNext Global, the Future X Tribe, and Beyond Academics. Executive Director, Matt Alex. Our moderators were Christine Lucer, Gabrielle Christovich, and Matt Alex. Edited by BeNext Global Media. Our music is by David Cutter. I'm Hector H. Lopez. We'll see you next time.